the head of the Iranian um, Atomic Energy Organization announced today that they will join the nuclear club within a month. So I don't know if it's true, I don't know if it's uh, in response to what's going on in Washington, but it's something something to keep an eye on. It's interesting. What do you say to their enemies? The Iranians announced it. The the head of the Iranian atomic uh, organization, uh, uh, the head of Iran's atomic energy organization, announced today that they'll join the, new, the World Nuclear Club within a month, and he inferred that they'll have uh, weapons because no country would think about attacking Iran after Iran's membership in the club. It's a direct quote. So interesting, as they say. Um, and one other announcement, I, if people can please put on their calendar, I urge you to come. Uh, Professor Asher Susser will be speaking on the 22nd of April at 4.15. Um, and we're going to have a reception, and it's the uh, annual Professor William Prusoff lecture. Professor Prusoff was actually one of the first uh, financial backers of the notion of ESA. And he's a professor emeritus, he's a professor of pharmacology and created the first generation of antiviral medication. And he's a very, he's not just because he helped Gisa, he's just a very special, uh, humble uh, man. And I, it would be nice if people come out to support the event. Uh, and he'll be, uh, Professor Prusoff and Professor Susser will be given the annual uh, prize for the Prusoff lecture. Okay, so today we're grateful and honored that uh, Kenneth Stern is with us. Today Kenneth Stern will be speaking about the new interdisciplinary field of hate studies and its relevance to understanding and combating anti-Semitism. Uh, Ken Stern is the Director of Anti-Semitism and Extremism at the American Jewish Committee. He is a, an attorney by training and he's also a lecturer at colleges and universities across the country. And he is a frequent contributor and uh, public media consultant for places such as Face the Nation, Crossfire, Nightline, Dateline, Good Morning America, and other major news agencies, including NPR. He's written New York. He's written op-ed pieces in places like the Washington Post and the New York Times. And he's a board member of the, uh, Gonzaga University, uh, their Institute for Action Against Hate. And this is where Ken has been a, 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 one of the organizers and movers of this sort of notion of hate studies, which I'm sure you'll, you'll speak on, which is a very important contribution uh, and certainly central to some of the issues that we discussed here at ESA. Um, while at AJC, he served as an expert uh, specialist in parliamentarian working group on policing and, and uh, prosecution at, um, Policing and prosecution at the London Conference on combating anti-Semitism. He's testified recently in, in, at the Canadian Parliament in their investigation into issues of uh, anti-Semitism. In 1997, he served as an invited presenter to the White House Conference on Hate Crimes, and he helped to organize and promote a team of law enforcement experts now working for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe to train police trainers in European countries on how to investigate and catalog hate crimes. This is very important uh, work. Um, and the list of Ken's accomplishments goes on and on, including all sorts of distinguished awards and, uh, and honors. And he's widely published. He's author of uh, many books and, and articles, and we're honored that you're here. <laughs> Thanks, Charles. I uh, tell you, you know, the things you stay in a place for 20 years, and it looks like you actually accomplished something. But, um, anyway, it's a pleasure to, to be here and to spend time with you. I've, I've really been a great fan of what Charles has been able to accomplish here, so I'm really glad to be able to come up and, and speak with you and uh, to share some, some thoughts on common concerns. Um, let, me, let me tell you about how hate studies actually came together. It's a, sort of an interesting story uh, because it does tie in directly with dealing with anti-Semitism in, in, in an important way. There, I don't know if you folks remember, but back in the late 70s, there was a compound established in uh, northern Idaho, uh, the Aryan Nations compound, which was 
had a lot of, of uh, problems associated with a lot of, of dangerous things that came out of it. But one of the things that happened when it started um, really organizing in the community there was that there was a parish priest, a guy by the name of Bill Wassman, who was very upset with the idea of what the Aryan Nations folk were doing. And Bill, for all his efforts in trying to organize people to push back against the white supremacists in the community, um, had his house firebombed by these guys. And Bill was the type of guy that just, you know, got him angry. So it took him about two years, and he put together, he left the priesthood, and put together this incredible organization, um, which unfortunately no longer exists, but for about 10, 15 years, it, it really was a model of how to deal with groups like this. It was called, it's a horrible name, but a great group, Northwest Coalition Against Malicious Harassment. And what Bill did is he put together uh, groups like AJC and ADL and labor uh, representatives and uh, law enforcement officials and others to try to figure out how do you push back against the mainstream of hatred, how do you marginalize the white supremacists, how do you push back against the NDP ballot initiatives which were coming up in the Northwest. And he did it regionally, from Oregon, Washington, Montana, Idaho, and then expanded it to, to Colorado. Um, and so Bill's conference is one I would always go to and I would participate in. And in one year, he asked me to give a keynote, and I said, sure, what do you want me to talk about? And he said, well, challenge us to do something. And my response was, well, you know, you're the guys that I hold up to a model every place else when they talk about how to organize against these groups in the community. Um, but it got me to thinking, and what it, what it caused me to concentrate on was that everybody else who was going to Bill's meetings was coming, were coming because of what they were doing for their day jobs. And certainly for me, people from the churches, people from the police departments, uh, people from the labor movement had their own you know, concerns as well. They were all coming associated with what they were doing. The academics that came, and there were a number of them, really were coming as individuals because they cared, but not as something really directly related to, to their um, in the day jobs. And so what transpired in that keynote was that I, I really challenged the academics in the community to try to put something together that would actually help uh, the rest of us that were working day to day on these issues. Because if you think about it, um, you know, hatred has been something that's been around forever. Um, Anti-Semitism is an important subcomponent of it, but it is a subcomponent of it. And that a lot of what people did in response to it, whether it was organizing against the area of nations in the panhandle of Idaho, or what governments do, or what nonprofits do, that a lot of it is, is being done by the seat of the pants and what we think works. And there's very little um, comprehensive uh, intellectual approaches to this that give us testable theories of what works and what doesn't work and why and how do we tweak it. And so what happened was that it took a number of, of uh, steps that some of the institutions wanted to pursue it, but couldn't bring any money. At Gonzaga University, they it just the timing worked out well. They had a conference there that both Morris Dees and I were, were keynoting. Uh, Bill was there, and they had an attack on some black law students there, so they wanted to do something. That was you know, over a decade ago. Um, and we built together an institution there that, that looks at this issue of hatred and how do we understand it. And the basic you know, thought about it in terms of the academic community is, look, hatred is something that's normative, it's been around, it's a problem for human beings as long as there have been human beings, regardless of when, regardless of where, regardless of the economic or political system, hatred is something that impacts human beings. And when we have something that's a, a constant that impacts human beings, we tend to look at it in terms of answers from an interdisciplinary perspective. For example, people get sick, so they have a good medicine that's more than a combination of parts of biology, and chemistry, and other related fields, or people need structures for, you know, for living and for work, so the field of architecture is more than the component parts of uh, you know, physics and art and math and the other things. We pull together because there's a need to address a problem, and we don't do that when it comes to hatred. They're very important things, in subcomponents of many academic fields, there's nothing that sort of pulls it all together to look at it holistically. 
And that is the challenge of what we wanted to, to do to, to um, try to understand. So in trying to figure out how this should come about, what we should do about it, we started looking at issues of hatred and you know what what is hatred? Um, and some of the social scientists we went to basically came to the conclusion that there was no common definition for it, or for prejudice or stereotype, and either which are different but related concepts. And that there you know, were things that were uh, attitudinal, things that were behavioral, there were things that were passive, there were things that were active. Um, and how, how do we identify what we need to look at? So at a conference in 2004, we basically came up with an understanding of what this field should see itself as doing. And the field of hate studies is defined as inquiries into the human capacity to define and then dehumanize and quote other, and the processes that inform and give expression to or could curtail, control, or combat that capacity. Um, with that as sort of the goalpost of what it is we wanted to look at, there were some things that we felt confident that we could say about hatred before the beginning. One is that it's a, again, it's a normative part of the human experience. There's a AJC poster that we use sometimes after a hate crime that's cuddling you know, little babies in diapers of different skin colors, and the, the tagline is no one is born hating. And I really detest that poster because I think it sends the wrong message. So I think hatred is a normative part of who we are. We may need some help in figuring out who to hate. Um, but you know, just like people aren't born speaking either, and at a certain point you're expecting to develop that capacity, I think we're all hardwired in terms of hatred. Whether we give expression to it, how strong, how strongly it affects us. You know, that, that are the, those are things that we've been discussed, but we've, uh, I think the historical record is pretty compelling, at least to me, that how we deal with people that we define as others um, has not been a good track record. Second thing that we feel pretty comfortable about is that frequently hate of others is expressed as love of self. And if you, anybody who wants to spend the time looking at the writings of David Duke or Louis Farrakhan or others to find ways of saying, you know, I don't really hate these folks, I just love you know, black folk, black folk, whatever. Um, but it's a strong tendency in a lot of the political expressions of hatred to justify it as, as loving self. Um, one of my favorites that's sort of a tangent of this is uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini, who gave a quote that it was actually, it was love of the other that that really justified his, his hatred. It said, if an infidel is allowed to pursue his nefarious role as corrupter on earth until the end of his life, his moral sufferings will go on growing. If we kill him, and we thus prevent the infidel from per perpetuating his misdeeds, his death will be to his benefit. So, you know, thanks a lot. Right? Um, anyway, so there were a bunch of questions that we started looking at when we put these together. And I'll just give you, give you some. And we can discuss any of this later if you want. But um, where is hate in its various manifestations, racism, sexism, anti Semitism, homophobia, etc.? Where, where does it come from? What motivates individual hate? Do we need to hate? And if so, why? How exactly do images of life and death, which if you read a lot of the, the things of, of people talking and expressions of hatred, life and death images seem to permeate that a lot? Um, do we need to feel strong emotions, such as hatred, to feel alive? Is fear of death of the group identity an extension of, of the self or something else? How do hateful ideologies skew our vision so that dangers to our existence are seen in every aspect of human life? And it's an important you know, uh, observation that people I'll talk about a little bit later to the, that people become supercharged in their identity and just get to the point where they see uh, further proof of the hatred that gives them a, a world view in all aspects of their life, in religion and culture and social things and so forth. When and how do different and sometimes competing hateful ideologies find common cause? You will find, for example, some black supremacists, some white supremacists find common cause around things like uh, Holocaust denial, for example. Um, what role does self-esteem self -esteem play in all of this? 
Is there a correlation between how much we hate the other and how strongly we feel connected to or good about our own group? If bigotry has to do with identities and when and how, how it's formed, influenced, and changed, and if it can't, if we, if it can't be uh, eradicated, how can we manage? What's the role of education in the world And I'll talk more about that a little bit later. What should government and social change agents, groups like AJC, the NAACP, and others, and groups like uh, USA, do? Um, why are some differences more important for defining others, say skin color or eye versus eye color, in some places? But in other places where those differences don't exist, others are found to replace them. There have been some studies that show uh, that in, in Cyprus, where you really couldn't tell by just the, the external things, like the difference between Greek and, and Turkish uh, cigarettes, you can tell differences by the brands of cigarettes people smoke. You know, so there are other things to use to differentiate and create this view of other. What's the role of dehumanization in all of this and dehumanization? Why are conspiracy theories so prevalent in ideology and hatred? If you draw a graph between the human thirst for university, universality on one hand and tribalism on the other, <coughs> how does hatred play out in that field? What motivates group hate? What makes it stronger? What makes it weaker? What's the role of stress, of fear, of envy? race, of power, of land, of economics, <coughs> of visions of sovereignty, of religion, of memory. How do individual pathologies, group pathologies, political ideologies, and theologies mesh in all this? What's the role of rage, of biology, of sex? When and why do people act differently than they feel about issues of hatred? There are some studies, social psychology studies, it shows that uh, somebody who's a restaurant owner said they wouldn't serve Chinese people back in the, I think it's the 50s or 60s, but they did. Or people that have black friends at work but don't invite them home. Or people that were, when David Duke was running, said they wouldn't vote for him, but actually ended up voting for him. Is hate ever a good thing? And you can make the argument that it might. You know, the work of World War II, you know, there's certainly hatred in Germany on the American shore. I would say that was probably a good thing. Um, what is the role of politics? How do concepts of nationalism and patriotism fit in? And there, there are a whole slew, I mean, of endless questions of how we look at hatred and the roles of different aspects of society. Uh, I mean, just to, to pick out one, you know, uh, Charles and I were talking a little bit before about the issue of uh, law and different countries that criminalize aspects of hate, such as Holocaust denial. Um, on one hand, you could argue that it sets a normative sort of boundary of what's acceptable. On the other, you could argue that what it does is it, it actually disempowers the ability to combat hatred because what it does is it says, we're going to prosecute something, and therefore, um, and the, the cases have shown that there's very little in the way of prosecution that take forever, then you have political leadership that's disempowered from speaking out because it says, um, you know, that there's a legal process. So how do governments, what the best way for governments to deal with this? Um, are there ways that governments haven't thought about dealing with hatred? I mean, look at the point of you're going to build something in a city. Um, you have to have an environmental impact statement in terms of what it's going to do the land, the air, the water, and so forth. But there's no sort of overarching mechanism to say, if we're going to build something, a park or something else. Is there something that we can do to deal with communities that may not uh, have connections with each other, that may have stereotypes about each other, to be able to bring them in a way that hasn't been done before. Um, I haven't seen any quantification by government or elsewhere in terms of what hate costs. If you add up that figure, and I'm not exactly not an economist, I don't know how you compute it, but I would think if you did add up the cost of hatred, it would be astronomical. So part of the problem in thinking through all these questions and there are many others I can lay out for you too, is we tend to think <coughs> in the academic community in very siloed ways. And I think in society as well. If we see it as a medical disorder, then you know, 
psychology and psychiatry or the cures of economics of the problem and we wait for the next up cycle. If it's a political event, we wait for some political change. You know, if it's a problem with the Aryan Nations folks, we call the FBI. And if you see it as a educational problem, we need to look at education as the, the total answer. If you see the, in, the problem is on an individual level, again, you look at psychology as the, the academic field, if you see it as a group phenomenon, and you look at the sociology of it, if you see a cultural issue, you look at the, you know, you call them the anthropologist, if you see it as a political problem, you call them the political scientist, if you see it as a moral issue, you call them the philosophers, but very few academics in these different fields are looking at this all together. It's all very, very siloed. Um, and that's, that is a prescription for disaster if you're looking for testable theories about how you should approach all forms of hatred, including obviously anti-Semitism. Um, so what we did, and I'll give you a little taste of it, in 2004 at, at Gonzaga, is we pulled together academics from different fields and experts on anti-Semitism and racism and so forth as well. And we said, okay, so if you're gonna build an interdisciplinary approach to give us these testable models, what do the different academic uh, silos, what do they have to offer for this? How do they work and what, would the, what component parts of this larger picture would they contribute? And just to give you, you know, a few, um, history was where we started with. Um, and that, for us, was given the overarching reference of how hatred has worked throughout history, throughout time. Um, it helped understand the triggers, what events and, and uh, parameters can um, be a catalyst for or uh, help define the launching of, of, a, of a spike in hatred uh, or the acceptance of hatred, the normalization of hatred. You know, the, the um, collapse of the peace process back in you know, the early 2000s was a precipitating excuse or event for a lot of attacks on Jews, for example, in, in Europe. Um, and so the, how do you look at historical events and understand them? History is also useful to look at how uh, references to historical memory are used to promote hatred. And uh, again, Holocaust denial is a prime example for the distorting of, of history. But you have other examples as well of how history is taken uh, out of context and used to give an ideological uh, boost to promotion of hatred. So, you know, there's a mine of uh, uh, treasure trove of information there. Psychology is fascinating. What makes some you think, see hatred as a normative aspect. What makes some develop hateful attitudes and not others? What are the differences? Um, and you have evolutionary psychology that basically says that everybody um, can do horrible things, not only hateful, you know, express hatred, but actually do things that are horrible based on their hateful um, views in, in the right circumstances. Um, but how do you understand those things that, that motivate people, that you know, make some altruistic, make some given to hatred and so forth? Um, one of the, the more interesting debates I had with Guru Hirsch about NPR years ago, um, right after the Oklahoma City bombing, I was on an NPR show with a guy named Jim Coates, who was a uh, reporter for the Chicago Tribune, who wrote this book about the skinhead and he wrote about it in an effort to shoot people away from, from this type of stuff. And it was one of Timothy McVeigh's favorite books. And Jim was, was horrified that what he wrote to say as a warning, he took it as a Bible. And so on the show, he basically agreed about everything about the militia movement at the time, this is like 95, 96. And one difference that we had was he was describing the militia movement as the sort of the, the kids that were not successful at alcohol problems, came from broken homes and went out and did this type of stuff. And I was saying, no, no, what we're seeing, we're seeing those folks too, but we're seeing some businessmen, some communities, some others that were, you know, sucked in as well. And, you know, we were, we were both right in the sense that um, what you had in a, in a movement, you had people brought in um, where they, 
you know, were brought on sort of mainstreaming issues and they became animated with a lot of the conspiracy theories and so forth. And then you had the ones that decided to go out and act on it rather than just to support the movement, which were also you know, quite critical to, to the success of the militia movement at the time. And you're the ones that went out and actually did the, you know, the deeds. So you had in psychology, not just you know, do you hate or do you not hate, but different types of activities and, and ways that people felt about the ideology that was motivating them. And a lot of it had to do with, with identity. I mean, we tend to think sometimes that people have these sort of narrow um, identities, but identity is a very multifaceted thing. I mean, I, I'm an American, I'm a Jew, I'm a man, I'm a husband, I'm an author, I'm a lawyer, I'm a father, I'm a fisherman. You know, a lot of different things. Um, and there are times where some things get, you know, more play than others. I mean, I, I, my daughter still remembers when, this is a long time ago, she was very little, when the Knicks were actually winning games. <laughs> and there was a playoff, again, it must have been in the late 90s, and I forgot she was on my lap. I, you know, maybe somebody <laughs> kind of jumped up, you know, cheered for something, and she looked flying. You know, it's happened once well, it happened twice, actually. But, <laughs> but for that moment, my identity, identity as a Knicks fan was more than my identity and as a father or someone my daughter would allege. Um, you know, how do people get to the point where their identity gets so supercharged that they see themselves, you know, just they're living every breath for this particular vision that's motivated by this hatred. There's a lot in psychology we can tell us. Social psychology. You know, there's a ton of work going back to Moderno, um, Sandy Milgram, um, you know, a lot of different different uh, studies show us a lot of really you know, interesting things that how symbols are important um, in, in terms of the, you know, the whole um, uh, sort of manifestation of hatred and how it impacts people. And when you look at the history of anti-Semitism in the swastika in Nazi Germany, or Confederate flags in the South, the KKK crosses, or the dressing styles of contemporary skin and it need not just be you know, things that are inanimate objects, too. I and mean, one of the things that, <coughs> that um, impressed me when I moved back to New York from Oregon back in the 80s was when Ed Koch was running for uh, one of the term as mayor and talked about you know, Jesse Jackson after his Hamilton comment and saying that Jews and supporters of Israel would be crazy to vote for Jackson, which I think was a fair statement to make at that point. But what was happening was that <coughs> Nobody realized that it wasn't Jesse Jackson the man that people were concerned about. It was Jesse Jackson the symbol that people were responding to. So symbols, in terms of how groups see issues of, of difference and hatred and so forth, are very, very important. And the flip side of it is you have police in various different parts of the country that finally got an idea of how do you deal with uh, hate groups and communities and how do you use the sort of social psychology of group identity to say, you know, not in our town, for example, is uh, the attack on the uh, Jewish uh, kid's room in Billings, Montana, when you had a, a menorah on his window and a brick up room. There's a, a bunch of uh, KKK activity that preceded that, and you had a guy who was a chief of police who basically understood, because he had come from Portland where they had a skinhead murder uh, a couple of years before, this is what we need to do to build a community to have everybody put the symbols like the Danes did in their windows to push back and create this sort of group culture against hatred. So there are ways in social psychology that can, can be used. Um, I, if I had to ever go back to college, I'm, as a, instead of a political science major, I'm a social psychology major, it's fascinating stuff. Anyway, sociology, how groups uh, look at each other. I mean, there's some very interesting work there, too, but just to pick out one, is a a woman named Kathleen Blee, who wrote on the difference of, in, in clan women, how they adopt racist attitudes versus anti-Semitic ones. And racist ones came from, you know, when she interviewed them, you know, I was sitting on a bus back when I was a kid, and I heard this you know, black kid who did something that annoyed her. Um, and that was where they could trace back their racism to, at least in their own mind. With anti-Semitism, they didn't really know Jews, but it came from, all of a sudden, this was a clear explanation of how the world worked, right? Ah, uh, now I know it's the Jews pulling this, the strings on this or that. Um, so there's a lot in terms of sociology. Other fields, too, and I, I won't get bogged down in going through these, but political science, law, journalism, so forth. Um, 
education, I want to spend a couple of minutes about because I think there's a lot of, of work that hate studies can do to help people figure out where education works and where it doesn't. Because there's a lot of, I think, misconception. The tendency I've seen, especially in the Jewish communities, to think that, okay, if you set up a Holocaust studies program, it's going to have something to do with pushing back on anti Semitism. From my point of view, there's no correlation there whatsoever, either with the anti-bias curriculums or the Holocaust curriculums. And just to give you um, an example, some of the major things that have happened over the last decade is you have the World Conference Against Racism in South Africa, which was a little orgy of anti-Semitism. I would dare say that the people that attended that that came from NGOs um, probably had more Holocaust education than the norm because they took the language of it and turned it back you know, just twisted to 180 degrees and accused Israel of doing all these things with that vocabulary of the Holocaust. Or if we look at, you know, how are you going to impact Arab and Muslim youth in Europe, which was correlated with the spike in anti-Semitic anti -Semitic attacks in 2002 and so forth. You know, teaching a kid uh, who has his world identity um, influenced by, you know, his imam and satellite television and everything else, we haven't talked about you know, learn about Wansi and other things. It's not going to really you know, do much. And seeing these images of his, in his mind, of his brothers being uh, harassed and killed in the Middle East, why is you know why are these grainy films from 60 years ago? So the Europeans going to have an impact on it. There was one study in American anti-bias and Holocaust-related uh, programs to look at their impact. Uh, once at Basic History, did one study of eighth graders over one year, and it found that for girls and for people that were not likely to be fighters, you know, um, it may have helped or didn't help at all, depending on, on how you looked at it over that, that period of time. But for uh, for boys that were like and others that were likely to be fighters, uh, they actually came out more prejudiced. Than the went in, as was the control group. Um, there's no long term study to show the impact of these things. And if you look at some of the studies on other things that have happened in schools, you know, say no drugs or the anti smoking campaigns, if you look at the long term studies five and ten years afterwards, the people that went through those programs are just as likely to smoke uh, and do drugs as those who didn't go through the program. So you know, if there is some correlation with these programs, combating bigotry and anti Semitism, there needs to be some study to show if they work, if they do, what models work, because there are all these different types of models from the experiment, experiential ones to uh, ones that are text-driven, and there, there hasn't been any study to show. Okay. Um, just a couple more points, and then I'll, I'll stop and the questions. There, one of the other reasons what for the importance of the endeavor of uh, hate studies is that we tend to, even experts who I, I really respect, tend to look at things in, in isolation and get answers to be wrong. I'll give you a couple of examples. Gerald Post, who I admire really tremendously, was the head of uh, political psychology at, at George Washington, was talking uh, a few years ago about some of the people on the far right uh, the skinhead, racist, very nation kind of crap, and explaining <coughs> that he said, quote, a little skepticism is healthy, but a deep craving for enemies is a spiritual pledge. You start with alienated or unsuccessful people, fill them with mind-numbing suspicions and rationalizations, and before <coughs> you know it, you've got, quote, patriotic resistors who say government is the agent of the Antichrist. Well, that's certainly true to a degree, but how does that relate to groups that do similar things, you know, the Ben Ladens of the world, or Hezbollah, and so forth. So, uh, you know, you tend to somehow be imprisoned by what you're studying and not looking at the larger picture to say what else you're doing in this picture. Or there was a, a guy from Harvard a few years ago, right after Buford uh, Faro uh, shot up the JCC in LA, um, and was making a case that there should be uh, an extreme racism classification of a mental disorder. Well, I understood what he was saying. You know, and get that nuts that you're going to go out and kill people and see little kids as the equivalent of little devils. You know, there's something nutsy about that. But the problem with 
and the sort of isolated ivory towers psychological view of the world that has no real connection to you know what you want to see happen. For example, if you had a concept of the legal system built into his view, what he was doing was going to be something that was going to be detrimental because if he did classify it, then many people could get off and things like that, saying it's a mental disorder. So um, you wouldn't necessarily want that to create a defense to a hate crime. And how does it explain in that type of uh, you know, view of the world where you have these conspiracy theories driving you right after 9 11, 48% of the New Weeks, I think it was, the poll was taking 48% of Pakistanis you know, thought it was uh, an inside job um, when the Israelis did it. And so you classify a whole society as having a mental disorder that doesn't quite you know, help. Um, some of the things I think are going to be of, of concern to us as the years go ahead, and that makes it even more critical to have a larger understanding of how hatred works. Um, it, if you believe the projections by the year 2050, we're going to have a majority of uh, non-white people in the United States. And for most of us, you know, it doesn't mean you know, anything. Um, but for some people, it will. And we're starting to see some of the pushback on that in the anti-immigration movement. I'm concerned, not just because I'm concerned about the potential spike in racism, or if you look at countries abroad that have had to deal with uh, how to you know, uh, approach others, communities as part of theirs, um, you know, the pain success in France, and Heider when it was alive in Austria, and the BNP's you know, success, um, and the recent uh, election in Hungary, for example. You know, are we going to have the same sort of manifestations here of people being able to organize around uh, that type of fear? And is that going to create a venue for hint of, uh, or a, a capacity for hatred to become more normalized? And anti Semitism certainly is an important concern in that way. Just, to give, um, just one little snippet of how the ideology works around about immigration stuff. And if you're a person that believes that either big time or small time, that the United States really ought to be a white country for whatever reason. And you see people that you uh, feel are inferior for one reason or another coming in and now becoming a majority. Um, and you see yourself as superior to them. How do you justify that? And that's where anti-Semitism fits in, because it gives people a rationale. Well, yeah, well, it's not, you know, what's happened is this, this nefarious part of the Jews who have made this happen. And you're starting to see more and more of that ideology around the, the immigration debate, certainly by the leadership of it. Um, globally, um, in terms of the, you know, the Islamists of the world, um, it's a concern uh, in terms of uh, how we're going to see hatred play out and kind of impact. Um, and what the field might do, ultimately, is to create a common vocabulary so that people can talk among different uh, academic fields, give it more of an integrated system uh, for research, um, and create an opportunity for a better understanding and guiding of action of all the different actors, whether it's government or private sector, um, and to really focus on the prime tools of, that we have been sort of shopping for the last 20 years without any real track record of showing that they work. Again, the educational programs. I mean, if you look at it from the point of going back to the, the, you know, the, the comparison I made to how we approach medicine, I mean, if we took something that was a particular problem uh, in the medical sphere and said, oh, here's a pill that we're going to give you to, to cure it, but well, we actually haven't done any testing, but trust us, you know, that's, you know, lawyers would say, well, that's you know, sort of negligent, right? Uh, but that's what we do with education approach. And I, I, I see it as a critical need for being a lot smarter as our resources are getting smaller and as our challenges are getting uh, larger um, across the board for law enforcement and others as well. Um, on campuses where we've seen some manifestations, I will you know, we'll talk about that in question. Some of it's been overblown in terms of the allegations of anti-Semitism on campus, but there's certainly have been some issues. And if we had this academic field of hate studies uh, that was incorporating more and more campuses, it would actually give you the ability to have case studies on campus and people to take what they learn and apply it to what's happening in front of them, which I think would be a lot uh, more healthy way to, to approach things. 
Um, one final thing I'm, I'm just happy to, to share with you is that um, we're going to have a second conference on populating you know, the, the field of hate studies. 2011 comes out, so I'm very eager to see the, the building upon the work that's already been done and to try to uh, create <coughs> more uh, academic programs around the country. We already have a couple of classes at Gonzaga, the interdisciplinary team taught about how to understand hatred. Uh, There's a second one that, that's, that just started up in you know, business school, and our goal is to try to get uh, different universities around the country to start adopting this model of working with us. I'd like to see, my goal is, you know, 10 years from now, it's like 10 or 20 places looking at hatred holistically in this way, trying to get these different component parts. And if I look parochially from my, you know, my day job as dealing with issues of anti-Semitism, I can't think of anything that's more important. I mean, there's a lot of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis at a national agency, both reactive and proactive. Um, but again, none of it is being guided by testable theories, a lot of it is being done by experience and what we think we know, um, and I, I, I think a lot of what we think we know is right, but we need to have the, the sharper minds that are helping test and guide what not only what we as, as Jewish agencies should be doing, as the Jewish community should be doing, but what all the different actors that can have an impact on anti-Semitism and particularly hatred in general. Um, you know, want to leave the world um, with you know, no more hatred than we're experiencing now. Yeah. Anyway, let me stop there because I talk more about it. Hello, thank you very much. Ken, I, I'm going to ask I think we're going to ask two quick questions. Sure. Um, so thank you very much. It's a, it's a very important subject that you're working on. And, and it's where I can ask you 20 questions, but I'll limit myself to two. Very briefly, and I know you deal with these issues. From a Jewish perspective, um, I know that anger, according to Maimonides, is the only human emotion that is completely negative. It's, there's nothing redeeming. If you're jealous, you can, there's a redeeming quality because it can spur you to do good things. If you're jealous of somebody, you can emulate them, try to do what they're doing, but anger is a, a completely negative emotion. What does the uh, Jewish teachings teach us about hatred? Is there anything redeeming in hate? That's the first question. Okay. Or I'll let you answer it. Well, you know, my wife's the rap. I know. So, <laughs> so, so I, I can't answer about, you know, the, okay. about Jewish teaching. I, I, I can tell you, though, from, from anger, I think there is a positive place for it. I gave you an example. It's one of the people you know, but I, I have a, a kid who's probably going to go to the University of Chicago next year. Really just uh, tanked out in ninth grade. He was, uh, you know, was in a very good boarding school. And we're finally opening up to understanding what was in this one. My wife and I got angry at which we had not been before. So I can point to the anger as a positive thing, as a motivating force. Okay. Second question. <laughs> um, you spoke about conspiracy theories. Yeah. And, and I think, and, you know, when you look at militia groups and mm -hmm. radical Islamists, this is a important part of the ideology and how they gain support for conspiracy theories. And I am beginning to believe that the greatest danger of radical Islam in the Iranian regime is not necessarily the nuclear weapon, but the, the sort of propagating of the protocols of the others of Zion and exporting it literally all over the world. And it's entering mainstream culture in the Middle East and then now into parts of South America, South Africa. It's becoming the genies out of the bottle. And I think this is extraordinarily dangerous. How do you? Engage, I'm using Obama's term. How do you engage with a social movement that believes in conspiracy theories? How, when you approach them rationally using social psychology and you know Western uh, social sciences and uh, an interdisciplinary perspective, how do you deal with a social movement that believes in conspiracy and is successfully propagating it and growing and using it? And there's no easy answer to that. So, uh, I tell you, when I think about this whole panoply of conspiracy theories and how they use it. I always come back to a bit of graffiti I saw in my freshman year at Bard College, a uh, man from Stahl. <laughs> it, it was, and it probably had nothing to do with, with this, but I, I saw this point. So if, if I didn't believe it with my own mind, I never would have seen it. 
And what happens, I think, is that when you look at, we were talking before about the kind of timid human phase of the world, when you have somebody that somehow sees, you know, oh my God, this is suppressed truth, and now I understand it. Now everything you know, sort of works really well. It's like the Holocaust in my eyes, the ones that really good. It. So then you start seeing things that you should, you know, say as well, gee, this is the cause, and you turn it around to things for the proof of what it is you start to believe in the beginning of. So it, it, it becomes a self feeding dog when you see it on the right, it's on the left, it's in the religious movements, and the secular movements, and so forth. The way I, I always try to define whether we should be concerned about anti Semitism is whether it's in the mainstream or not. Okay, I and mean, that's partly why I was, you know, taking some hits back when everybody was going crazy with the Bernie Madoff stuff. You know, anti Semitism is going to go rampant in and the, the economic collapse right before that. That's all if you look historically, that's you know, there's we have Boski, we had, you know, Milken, we had others and it hasn't played out that way. And here are the reason why I think it may not, you know, play out that way. Um, this time people may not go down that that particular road. So the, the question is whether it becomes, what well, in some places in the Middle East, it did. You know, there they, they were all these conspiracy days going on. So the question is whether, it, in a sort of the general day-to-day -day thing, it's part of the explanation or not. Um, in the, you know, the, the collapse of the economic uh, system, I saw much more in terms of, of Latinos and, and uh, you know, other quote, unworthy minorities who got the, you know, the subprime loans, that's what you were seeing some mainstream commentators. Nobody was talking about the Jews, right? So in these countries where it becomes just sort of normative to explain everything by the nefarious Jews, and I, I, I don't see, I, I disagree with you some in the sense that I don't think it's the protocols that are driving it. The protocols are a good tool for people to, to use, but that just becomes so normative. And the question is, how do you, push back against it. I think there are a lot of different things that you know need to be done. Hannah Rosenthal has a big challenge in terms of making sure that the State Department has it as a priority that when they meet with these folks and they see this type of stuff, uh, at least the leadership knows there's a displeasure about it and why and why that's a challenge. Um, you know, I think that, that there are other um, you know responsibilities, media groups and others. But it becomes a real challenge. I don't know, you know, it so becomes so much of an avalanche of of day-to-day uh, -day normative discourse here that you can't just sort of flip a switch and turn it off. And that's one of the reasons why I, I sort of hope that this field you know, comes together because it may give better answers than we have at the moment. I mean, when we write something for AJC, we always do it, you know, it makes us feel good, but it doesn't have any impact. How do you have an impact? I would love to see people study more on these sides. How do these institutions work? How can you turn around? What are the pressure points? Uh, what can they respond to? I and mean, what's a long term strategy? I um, highly agree with uh, the goals that you present and the, the um, motivation for doing um, real research, not mm -hmm. only like talking about stuff. So I really agree with everything. One thing, I, uh, because you mentioned um, many times social psychology or mm -hmm. post or psychology in general. So I think uh, it's important to compare uh, when you structure a program or, or like something really huge or, uh, in the States. So it's important to look at the way that psychology did over the years because the beginning was like studying really the, the bad side, I mean, like abnormal psychology and everything. And then the, the other phenomena that um, medical students and psychology students become like aware, I mean like they imagine that they have the disorders that they study because like we are really um, affected by the situation. And so, and, and then the movement that started in the 2000s was like the positive psychology movement, um, and this is really, uh, like by, by Martin Zellinger, saying that uh, we can make a better effect if we emphasize the positive qualities of human nature. And like, so you can structure exactly the same goals, but just frame it differently, like uh, combating antisemitism or fighting racism. Like, if you structure what we call like uh, studies of hatred, so I am a graduate student of hatred studies. What does it that what does it do to my mood? I mean, on everyday basis. So it's like I think it's important to think about it because uh, this is what affects us actually. 
Um, and like Martin said, I'm the head of the positive psychology uh, program in um, Penn, in UK. So he does amazing work with the army. I mean, like schools, are very effective. So I think like if, if we want to make a change, we should do it the way that it works. Uh, so, so, and he has results for that. And so, like, if we compare it to findings that we have for treatment uh, effectivity, like using psychodynamic therapy or other uh, uh, that really um, um, emphasize the dark side of, the, of human nature, we see that it's like less effective. So, we, we, we should, uh, I think, give better thought of how to frame it uh, that it would be efficient, not only uh, important. Oh, good. Other studies. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, but first of all, I I agree with the, the, the that things that come from different academic fields tell you how to be more effective are very important to pay attention to. In terms of the framing of the the enterprise, though, as opposed to the looking at how um, you know something like that, like you know, on an individual level, we have we have a lot of discussion about how to do this because you know from from the point of view of how do you raise money for something called hate steps? Right? <laughs> <laughs> What's going on with your money, there, right? Uh, but you know, some, some practical things. But what was what was interesting is when we started talking about it, people saying, "Well, we're talking about peace studies." I said, "Well, no, we're I'm, or how do you get people to you know to coexist?" I said, "No, I mean anti-Semitism is a good example. You could have you know, a tremendous amount of hatred in places where no Jews. You know, so we're not necessarily talking about how do you deal with conflicts again." Um, and after everything got involved every number of years, actually the board just voted to change the name of the Institute for the Institute for Hate Studies. Because if you look, if you Google hate studies, it's the only thing that, that appears. Or if you Google anything else, it's related to it, there are tons of things. And what, what we wanted to do is not only to be sort of unique, but also really to focus on the fact that human hatred is something really difficult to look at. And it's something very important to look at and to call for what it is. Now, in terms of whether you're dealing, whether you know, dealing with an individual who comes out of a you know, skinhead group, you want to, you know, get to, you know, to be a whole person, you know, back in society. Whether you do a positive image or a negative image, that's you know, a different thing. But in terms of what we're calling this, I think the, the board has it right. That it's an ugly thing. We need to give the ugly name. Professor Ed. I have two questions also. One is, um, I was struck by your comment that we're born with innate DNA by nature. Uh, I'm just wondering, when there's just two things in the to You didn't say anything about DNA. Well, <laughs> it's implied. Hardwired. I said hardwired. Hardwired is close to it. Um, but uh, but Tutsi and the Hutu did not have hate for each other until the colonialists found it convenient. The, the, uh, the related to that is the question of uh, tribalism in Africa. Usually, uh, hatred comes from some kind of envy about natural resources or something else. It isn't innate, I don't think. But you were sort of saying, well, we're born with it, somehow it has to come up. So that's my first question. Is that really your position? Yeah. The second. I'll, the second, I'll explain it. <laughs> it's a little, it's a very negative position, I think. Uh, nothing much can be done if that's the case, it has to come out somewhere. Anyway, my second question is, does your day job interfere with your vocational interest? Because it seems to me that your day job, I would think, has something to do with anti-Semitism being somewhat unique. While your vocational interest in hate is, doesn't make anti-Semitism unique, it's one of many interests. Well, let me answer the second one first. I don't see it as interfering. I, I see it as, as very well related because I think if you look at anti-Semitism as a subcomponent of the human history and capacity to hate, then it becomes more understandable because you talk about the unique aspects of it. And many different types of hatred have unique aspects. Um, so it gives me actually greater capacity is to, to point out its unique characteristics. Um, so I don't see it as a detriment at all. I see it as, as something that, that, that helps. Actually, what it does is it helps me, especially in, in let's just talk parochially, in Gonzaga, which is the first university to really sort of enthusiastically embrace this, it's a Jesuit university. And it gives me there you know, a lot of capacity. 
capacity to talk about anti-Semitism in a way that's probably not you know, heard of there. So there's this sort of lefty sometimes tendency to beat up on Israel, which you know we've all seen. You know, Israel can criticize for a variety, it's a whole other talk, uh, a whole variety of things, but one of the comes, you know, outside of the way you challenge other countries and you have differences of opinion with their policies and so forth, there's something else going on there. And these folks at Gonzaga sort of understand that better than people that may swim in the same waters as they do in sort of the, the lefty, you know, the Christian theological movements. So I see it as a way, it's, it's, a, it's a, not only just in terms of the enterprise, but in terms of the day-to-day -day work as a, as, a, as a plus. In terms of the hardwire, I, you know, I think, I think the answer has to be, you know, yes, the, the, the South Pacific sort of model that people have to be taught to hate, I think, um, it presupposes that we're all sort of these angelic blank slates and then something comes along and hates us. Hatred has been so, um, manifest throughout history, regardless of, again, you know, where and when and so forth. I mean, sometimes worse, sometimes better. Sometimes there have been divisions that are um, between one group and another that weren't seen at one point and then were seen at other points. But the, it seems to me that, that the capacity to somehow see somebody else as an other and then somehow, you know, demean them uh, to the point where they relate become hatred, um, you know, is, is part and parcel of who we are. There's some social psychology experiments, for example, which are fascinating. To take a room like this and, you know, just tell everybody we're going to do, you know, coin flips or odds and even, just totally random ways of selecting two groups, and then follow up with the perceptions of the people in the group about themselves and about the other group. And you know, the studies have shown that people in each group think that they're smarter, that they're you know they're better looking, and so the other group, even though they all know intellectually that this is an entirely random selection. So the, the, how we deal with people that we see as others, I mean, this, in some ways, when we talk about names for this, you know, maybe more precisely talk about otherism. But I'm <laughs> never going to have any more success raising money for that. So, uh, <laughs> so, but you know, I, I think there is some way of how we deal with that. that that's part of and again, you know, who are we going to end up hating and whether it's going to become something that's just annoying or genocidal. So a whole range of differences there. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's all made up. Yeah. yeah, a comment on the last point and a question related to Gus's other question. Um, I'm a neurobiologist and social psychologist. And I don't, I don't, I'd say the more current neurobiological theories about our brain and how it develops do not include any component processes built into it or hardwired into it of the nature of hatred or altruism or any other psychological concept. There are other characteristics, of course, of our brain that interact developmentally with the environment that then produce certain characteristics. But those innate characteristics of the brain to start with are of a very different level, a different category, a different sort of neurobiological or some sort of basic process of interaction with the environment. Um, but they don't have in us anything as developed specifically in our co uh, that would match our psychological categories of, of uh, hatred, for example, or altruism. Uh, that's sort of the way neurobiology is, is going now. Um, I think also think that your idea of having an interdisciplinary approach to a question like this is valuable and drawing on academic expertise to inform um, efforts in the field like yours also very valuable. So my question is, since you started this interdisciplinary effort, are there, can you give us a couple of examples in which the hate studies work that you're familiar with now has actually concretely informed some action or program in your day job? The, well, two, two things. One because I've also interested in some of the concrete things you right. do in your day job. And right, right, right. Them well, yeah, two things. One, one is I'm, I'm fascinated afterwards to, to talk about this. One of the, the uh, there's a guy named uh, Ed Glazer who was a uh, uh, he wrote a thing on neurobiology and came for a journal. I'm sorry, 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 I'm sor
a piece of looked at. It was more. It was very interesting. It was more about what we don't know than what we do know. Uh, so there may be things that you do know, you know, yeah. you know, talk to you about. Um, in terms of coming out of the, the field to you know to be adopted, look at on um, on one level the answer is no because it's, it's new. It's it starting you know uh, the first couple of classes we've had. You know, the journal and the kind of the field. Um, on the other hand, I, I think that the answer would be yes. I'll give you two examples. One of the things that was really fascinating to me was that there was a, at this first conference in 2004, there were people that from um, a sociologist and I think it was a political science or an anthropologist, they were looking at similar things, but they never really communicated outside of their field. So in terms of the, the studying of it, I, I saw some positive things of connecting people from different fields and saw overlaps and saw things that they could use for each other in a way for, for the research. So that, that was good. And for me, just being sort of around and being a gap by trying to, to, to push this is a good idea. So I'm not an academic by training as is trust I'm a lawyer and an author. Um, you know, I, I tend to pull what I can and what I've learned from this enterprise to, to in my day job. Now, whether, you know, whether paid studies hadn't existed, I've come to the same conclusion, you know, maybe. But what I really do look at is I try to look at systemically when we're um, making choices of what to do and what not to. I don't have what I would love to have, which is the ability to say, okay, here's what we think, here's a theory, let's go get a control and test it out and figure out somebody else is doing something. Or you could just give us a flavor. You could pick a sure. concrete action that sure. your committee sure, does. Sure, sure, sure. Um, for example, there was a Israel apartheid week. Was last Israel week. Right? Israel apartheid week. You know, everybody know what that is? Mm -hmm. Not? Okay. There, there was, okay, I'll explain this. About was it six years ago, seven years ago, uh, starting in Canada, there was a group of students that put together uh, something called Israel apartheid. We can, part of what we know is the, trying to shoehorn the Israeli-Palestinian conflict into the, yeah. the you know.